welcome. <laughs> welcome to Learning Space. Okay, let's try this again. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Learning Space. Uh, my name is Nicole Gallucci. I'm a postdoc with CosmoQuest, and I am joined by my excellent co-host, Georgia Bracey. Hello, everybody. Has been rocking the show without me quite a few times in the last month. Because <laughs> I seem to be not here a lot. Um, stop traveling. Sorry. Can't stop the traveling. Can't stop. Must go to all the cool places and share science with people. Oh, she's everywhere. She's yes. everywhere. And don't mind me while I set up com comment tracker again. Yes. Give me a minute. Ah, okay. That's something that still mystifies me, so... It's all good. Um, but yes, you can comment as you watch the show from a variety of places, and we'll do our best to keep track of them. That's right. So I am sitting on comment tracker. It's, it's already set up. If you're watching this on YouTube, you can send us comments there. If you're watching on the event page, I just got that in there. And I'm trying to put the link from my page, but that doesn't matter as much. Okay, but I've got okay, I've got all those sources. So there's also a new feature in Google Hangouts called Q and A. And so if you're watching this somewhere, you see a little yellow bar that says "Ask a Question." Uh, there is a separate app for that. So I will try to remember to check that one as well because it's not in the same place. <laughs> so you can use use YouTube, use Google Events as before, the event pages before, um, and say hi. Um, and we are going to be talking all about gravity. And uh, maybe Georgie can start us off talking about why we've been thinking about gravity lately at Cosmo. Yes, yeah, so we've been thinking a lot about gravity lately. Um, We've also been working on this wonderful new classroom unit um, called Investigate for um, teachers, middle school teachers that want to do some citizen science in the classroom and you want to learn a little bit about asteroids. So the NASA Dawn mission um, recently visited Vesta and you can help them analyze what they have found there if you go to CosmoQuest.org and you try the Citizen Science Project. It's a pun, guys. Just so you don't know, you can't, you can't tell just from saying it, but investigate is a pun on the name of the asteroid that we're studying. So, we sorry. Love Continue. It. We love it. So, <laughs> yes, you can go to CosmoQuest.org and do Asteroid Mappers, the Vesta edition, and actually help the scientists uh, look at the beautiful pictures of Vesta and, and analyze that data. So teachers, of course, would like to get their students to do the same thing, interact um, with some good data collection activities, uh, see what real science is all about. So we are working on a curriculum to help them bring investigate, or sorry, it's called investigate, help them bring um, asteroid mappers into the classroom. So a big part of this curriculum is looking at the early solar system. Um, how did it start to form? Where do we get asteroids from anyway? How did they happen? Um, and a lot of this has to do with gravity. So this whole idea of, you know, how do you teach gravity? What do people think about gravity? It's a very interesting and a very complex idea. So that leads to lots of misconceptions and misunderstandings about gravity. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that today because our investigate unit is, uh, at this moment, it's about 13 days of classroom activities uh, and assessments and all that good stuff. And one, I think it's day two, um, early on, you get to do a little bit of fun with gravity. Yeah. That's, that's a big player in how our solar system formed. So I did yeah. an accretion activity with Plato on a previous episode of Learning Space. Yeah. I don't remember how long ago it was. And uh, I you took different colors of Plato. It, it is very fun, and you can go back in the archives and see that one. I think it was when I was talking about... Yeah. It's whatever episode I had to do all by myself. So it's me rambling for 40 minutes. But uh, I did use Plato to uh, model how accretion happens in the early solar system and ended up with this glob of hardened Plato that is now all the same color. It's literally, I think, pink, yellow, and blue that have all been mixed together. And it still sits on my desk. So go find that uh, accretion activity that I did. Um, that doesn't explore gravity itself, per se, but it does talk about the accretion processes that, that create the planets in the solar system and in all ex exoplanet solar system. What is the name we're using for this now? Is it exosolar system? <laughs> I don't even know. I should, uh, I should ask someone. The closest we've gotten to anything is early formation of rocky bodies in the early solar system. Right, they, but how do, how do we call it, how do we call a, solar, a system of exoplanets? Is it an exosolar system? 
Oh, sorry. Gosh. Um, I don't know. I don't know the correct terminology. I should go ask a Kepler scientist. I feel like this is something I should know. All oh, right. Exosolar system. Exosolar system. exosolar system. We're gonna we're gonna use that for the next few minutes until somebody corrects me in the comments. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we ha so what what other I don't remember off the top of my head what other activities we have on other than the misconception cards which we'll get into in a bit. What other gravity stuff do we have on that day? So the first thing is doing um, the old Galileo or possible whether or not he actually did this is um, I guess not totally known uh, for sure, but it's claimed that he did this. He went up to the top of a tall tower and he started dropping things. The from Green Tower of Pisa, tower. in particular. Right. <laughs> so something many other people have done <laughs> since then, in the name of science. Uh, so he was looking at falling objects and comparing how things behaved when they fell from a great height. And so, sort of a mini version of that is one of the first activities. This is something. Um, you can do with your students. You can have them first of all talk about and think about you know what what happens when you drop objects of different weight or different mass, different shape, different size, all kinds of things. So um, to start to elicit the ideas that they have about falling objects and about gravity, because that's that's a really important part of education is to look at what people are already thinking because. Um, we don't just dump information into people's heads, into their empty heads. What? <laughs> it would just be too easy that way. Um, people already have ideas uh, about gravity. And of course, you know, growing up on planet Earth, we deal with gravity every day. So, um, you know, we have a lot of ideas, for better or worse, about gravity that we come into the classroom with. So your students are going to have all kinds of interesting ideas, and you need to sort of get them out there before um, you can really start to have them learn. So ah! I fell out. Juan, and she's back. I fell out. Okay, okay. we're back on. Continue. Okay. Sorry. So that's okay. Jeez. So think about falling objects, all different sizes and shapes of falling objects, and then ask yourself, you know, do they fall at the same rate? Does some fall faster? Do some fall slower? Um, you know, what makes the difference? Um, so talk about that, and then they get to try it out. So they get to get a bunch of different objects from around the classroom, um, simple objects, and then sort of do their own experimenting, do their own um, trial and error kinds of things with these objects. So take two objects, um, put them up at the same height, let them fall, and just observe. Take notes. Do they, do they hit the floor at the same time? If not, why do you think that happens? What do you think is going on? And so they'll get to see things like, of course, you know, air resistance comes into play. So if you drop um, some sort of like a golf ball and you drop a piece of paper, you know, obviously the piece of paper is going to float its way down gently, you know, to the floor and the golf ball will just plummet very quickly. So what's going on there? Is that just how much they weigh, their mass, their shape? <laughs> the live demonstration of, of oh, hardened yeah. Play-Doh and paper right there. Sure. Ah! Yeah. See? So that's a start, yeah, to start to sort of tease out what's going on. I can drop a ninja in a piece of paper? <laughs> okay, I'll stop. Sorry. <laughs> what happened? We can't see. Huh? Oh, I dropped them on the floor. <laughs> we don't have a view of the floor. Did they hit at the same time? That's no, they didn't. Here. Okay. There. Actually, you can oh, probably God. hear, you can probably hear the ninja hit the table before the uh, paper leaves the field of view. Ah, see, there you go. <laughs> Science people. All right. I know, and lis <laughs> actually listening is a good way to tell if your objects are hitting at the same time or not. So, do you hear two sounds at impact, yes. or do you hear just one? Because it is, it's, it can be difficult to tell with just your eye, just looking. But you can get an idea of some of the different things that are happening, and then, of course, finally, you can take a piece of paper, two identical pieces of paper, and you can crumple one up. Leave one flat so you know that one, you know, they have the same mass. And and then see, drop them and see what's going on. So two things of the same mass, uh, one still dropping and hitting the floor quicker than the other one. 
So, um, so that's just sort of a, a beginning investigation into what's going on with dropping or with falling objects on the yeah. Earth. And then we have spoiler a alert: air thing. resistance matters. <laughs> <laughs> Talk about air resistance. Yes. Um, and then you can show the nice video. Um, I forget which astronaut it is who did the experiment on the moon. I I don't know. Are you googling? We could Google that, yes. real quick, but I can never <laughs> remember that. Um, it's just Apollo so, 15. It's 15. Uh, David Scott, according to. Is that who? Okay, yeah. I always forget the Google. Forget it the was name, but it he, was a hammer and a feather. Yep. So he took you know two objects. One which on Earth the feather would have a lot of air resistance involved in its fall, and the hammer which wouldn't have quite so much. But you take the atmosphere out of the equation, and you let them drop, drop them at the same point at the same time, and you can see really clearly and nicely on his video that yep they hit at the same time. So you need to uh, take that air resistance out, and and then you can get a clearer picture of what's going on. So all of that is in um, the first activity. And investigate with starting to investigate. We can show, we show the video. Yeah, cool. There's no audio, but he's explaining. I have a hammer and I have a feather. And he says one of the reasons we're here today is because of a gentleman named Galileo. So we're going to test this. So this is pretty pretty stunning. I know. I love that he brought a feather all the way to the moon. <laughs> it is a falcon feather. A falcon feather. And he's going to drop them. Yep, they hit at the same time. Yeah. Something you cannot see on Earth. And it's so wild. It just looks so wrong for the feather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it just totally blows you know, your... your preconception of what falling things are supposed to look like. Right. That in itself is, yeah, worth Yes, the, the feather and the hammer just boop at the same time. Yeah, yeah. Different masses, but the same acceleration. So that's the, uh, the physics yep. behind that. Yep. So uh, then we have a nice little uh, card game that we're working on to deal with yes. some of these misconceptions and just some interesting ideas about gravity. So we have a whole list and if you if you Google, if you look around, I mean there's tons of misconceptions that people have about gravity. And you know, some of them are I don't know, just more simple than others. Others are more fundamental uh, misunderstandings almost about what's going on. So mm -hmm. um, misconceptions can be very hard to get rid of. Because most of the more fundamental ones are based on our everyday experience that we've, you know, had for our whole entire life. So it's really difficult to counteract something you seem to experience correctly, you think, every day. And you've got in your mind sort of a really nice explanation for how this thing called gravity works. And then you get into the classroom and you bump up against this other explanation, you know, from your teacher that doesn't fit with your own experience, your years of experience. And so what do you do with that? So it's sort of that conflict that starts the whole um, learning process going. And so if you don't have enough good experience and enough really hands-on experience with that new concept, you know, it might sort of chisel its way into your brain a little bit, but it's going to get kicked right back out if you don't really wrestle with it and work it into your own, you know, system of how you understand that concept. So that's why, you know, lots of activities are good, hands-on experience is really good, um, because that lets you really wrestle with the, with the concept and, and make it a permanent part of your way that you understand how the world works. So, um, I yeah, so uh, we have a comment from, uh, so just to let you guys know, my comment tracker is now broken, but I'm trying to follow on the event page on YouTube anyway, because I love you guys. So uh, if you have certain um, interesting gravity facts or misconceptions you want to share with us, that would be awesome. Help us out, Maiden. Yeah, we're kind of collecting them. We are collecting. We are collecting gravity misconceptions. Um, 
Guido Vibra says, we need to replicate that experiment when we get back to the moon one day, preferably on live HDTV. And we now have the bandwidth to do that. <laughs> we can no. have our future astronauts. Yes, yeah, so you can't actually um, do that experiment. Uh, I guess you I mean, okay, so your typical student cannot do that experiment. Uh, you know, you can, if you have a vacuum chamber, access to a vacuum chamber, you do that mm -hmm. experiment. That one's a bit tough. But you can play. So what I discovered when I was taking physics in high school is you can play with uh, the idea of gravity and uh, gravity and acceleration on an elevator. So if you happen to, to live in a building or <laughs> work in a building where an elevator is not used all that much and you can get away with this, is to take a bathroom scale into an elevator and see as the elevator is accelerating and decelerating when you go up and down, how it actually changes the reading on the scale and what does that mean? Um, so this is, I, I didn't do, I didn't actually bring a bathroom scale into an elevator, but I did uh, jump at the moment of acceleration and deceleration in an elevator in a hospital I was working at at the time. Do you want uh, to weigh yourself when you're going up or going down? Either one. It's the and, and when you're it, it, it's the acceleration and deceleration at the beginning and end of the trip is when it makes a difference. So the constant velocity of the trip up or down doesn't matter, but when you're going up or down, uh, whether you're accelerating up or decelerating as you go up will actually change the measurement on the scale. But like I said, you can feel that effect if you jump at the right time. <laughs> so for those of you who have been in an elevator with me and I've jumped randomly, this is why. <laughs> I, I do funny things like that. Um, I'm sometimes. amazed that that actually works. <laughs> it does. It totally works. It totally works. You can feel the difference. Um, we, it, but yeah, red. <laughs> I actually got a group of people who do it at Dragon Con. So. Yeah, lovely physics problems written yeah. all about that. <laughs> I, I got a bunch of people do it at Dragon Con. You so. did? Well, after the, the day after. Well, the night, the last night of Dragon Con when most people had left. We were, we were doing superhero up. The, we were really, we literally ran out of stuff to do, so we were riding the elevators up and down. <laughs> and I had everybody jump to feel the acceleration and deceleration difference. <laughs> I was doing physics. It was fun, but uh, that I do not recommend you put all your students in an elevator. But this is a, you know, it's, it's a separate activity you can do with your your own child uh, or, or yourself for your own curiosity um, yeah. to, to play around with the idea of acceleration and gravity. Um, but anyway, back to the cards. <laughs> <laughs> this has been my thought processes today. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so, so, let's, so we're collecting misconceptions. Um, yes. Or just alternate, you know, some people call them alternate conceptions because misconception right. sounds kind of heavy and, and negative and, you know, and it's really not that it's it's a bad thing because every, everybody has misconceptions about everything. It's how you, how your brain works, how you collect information. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the misconceptions are actually helpful. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we manage to get out of bed and get to work and do all our things, you know, and operate in a world of gravity all the time. So apparently, you know, you can be relatively successful in life and have these misconceptions hanging around in your brain. Um, but, you know, if you want to investigate and you want to go further and learn more and think about all these cool ideas, you know, then, yeah, you have to, you have to do a little, uh, just do some activities. It's interesting yeah. that you say about living and working in gravity, you, you just handle it without thinking about it. And it's really interesting to hear the experiences of astronauts who have spent a significant amount of time on a space station because <laughs> they come home and they can't handle gravity anymore. <laughs> you know, like... Um, They'll, you know, or, or well, I mean, when, once they get to the space station, they have to be able to uh, adjust to the fact that, uh, you know, you, when you put something down, it doesn't stay where you put it. It just puts off. Um, or that, you know, in order to turn a door handle, you, you're going to, like, <laughs> turn yourself. <laughs> Um, and they slowly, so yeah, they actually have to adapt to a completely different environment. Um, and, and when they come back home, they can't like they'll walk into things because they're just not used to dealing with gravity. You have to readapt, right. readjust. Right. Right. Yes, there used to be. I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. There used to be a really funny um, NASA video that I I would show my fifth grade students, and it was um, oh gosh, it was Sally Ride, and it was way back. Um, uh, but it showed astronauts on a space shuttle and how they you know lived and worked, and it was kind of funny. And they showed all the funny little gravity or 
microgravity effects of, you know, liquids forming little, you know, spheres and things and floating around. And yes, things, you know, you have to tether things because otherwise they float away. And of course, you know, the hair flying everywhere and um, people being, you know, one person eating, you know, right side up, according to our perspective, and the other person just next to them, you know, upside yeah. down. All, yeah. all that fun. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun, but it really does challenge, you know, how you think about things and look at things. I was watching them do a live Q&A from the ISS a little while ago, and it was so funny because, you know, they're standing there, well, stand, they're floating there holding the microphone. <laughs> they must, I think it was actually Chris Hadfield. So he's holding the microphone. And then he goes to demonstrate, and he just lets go to demonstrate something with his hands. And the microphone's just there. And then he just, you know, casually picks it up with the other hand. I'm like, that that just happened. <laughs> <laughs> that is so cool. Um, and, of course, though, we're talking a lot about space station and, and, and gravity in space. And yeah, uh, the so, right. weightless or microgravity yeah. environment, and that's one of our big misconceptions. Misconception, right? right? There's no gravity in space. Mm -hmm. False. <laughs> Correct. Come in. All right. What do you get? You get a ninja. Where's I the get a ninja. I, these, these have been showing up on our desks. There's a little desk war going on back here. All right. <laughs> There's an alien, too. This is more appropriate. Um, so, yes. Uh, so, of course, there is gravity in space. And, in fact, the gravitational pull of so most of our work um, by astronauts and cosmonauts and taikonauts is all being done in low Earth orbit. So it's actually not that far above the surface of the Earth, relatively speaking, um, that all this stuff is happening. And so that distance from the surface of the Earth, the gravitational pull of the Earth is only slightly reduced compared to what we feel here. Um, so there's just as much gravity uh, in low Earth orbit where astronauts are working as there is yeah. on the surface of the Earth. So the question something is... Something like 88% or almost 90 Oh, is it? I thought it was... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's something like 90-something percent. Most. <laughs> right. You still have most, yeah, most of the effect. So, um, you so know, so, yeah, so what's going on? And again, you know, you can, you can understand how people get that misconception. Um, especially because it's you watch the videos from yeah. space and things, and that's like the coolest, most impressive thing you notice yeah. is oh, people can float around. And, right. You and know, we call it weightlessness so, and right. microgravity, which are just complete misnomers. Yeah, yeah. So some, yeah. So sometimes the names of things, the mm -hmm. vocabulary, is what leads us astray in really getting a good understanding of these concepts. So, um, so it's not you know, a surprise at all that students and, and adults, students of all ages get these misconceptions um, from looking at these videos, hearing the words, and you know, and you want to believe your eyes, and it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense because most of us don't get the thrill and the fun of going up in space. Uh, so, you know, for, yes. so for us it works. <laughs> yeah, so, so the question is then, why does it appear weightless? Why do people and things appear weightless in, in, uh, in low Earth orbit? And so the, the answer to that is, um, is that uh, basically the capsule that you're there in, the structure, the space station, the shuttle, whatever they're in, is in free fall around the Earth. So it is falling towards Earth. But it's orbiting at a quick enough speed that it's going to go around the Earth and not actually hit it. This is a good thing. Yeah. So it's in free fall around the Earth, and then the person inside it, here. So here's, here's my spaceship. Ninja? And here's, no, it's going to oh. be alien. Here's my astronaut. They're both in free fall around the Earth, and so their acceleration is the same as they're both in free fall. And so relative to each other, the alien is floating in the space capsule. Um, but it's feeling just as, as much as feeling the same gravity that um, almost the same gravity it would feel on the surface and feeling the same gravitational pull as the spacecraft. And because they're both in free fall, that is why you get the feeling of weightlessness. Uh, and this is, of course, simulated by, by an aircraft, by aircraft that can that do parabolic flight paths, and so right. they do a lot of testing. Also be fun to do. That would be a great second choice if I can't get into space. <laughs> that is a lot more affordable. Actually, I, I don't. It's way out of my price range, but it's a lot more affordable. How affordable than are we talking here? Yeah, we're still talking expensive. But it's a. Th I mean, it's a thing people do yeah. <laughs> for for fun. Is like you can book, you could book a flight on on the. I don't know what it's actually called, but uh, and the KC one thirty five is the one that they use at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, 
So, yeah. Uh, we have a comment, a great comment from Guido saying, Chris Hadfield, so the uh, astronaut we were talking about before, who was a, briefly the captain of the International Space Station, or what do they call him? Captain? Chief? I don't know. The guy who was in charge. Um, commander! That's right. Commander of the International Space Station. He's a Canadian astronaut. Um, he said something. He had to relearn how to play guitar in Zero-G because the you know, the instrument feels much, much different, you know, it doesn't pull down. So when he made that really cool Space Oddity, Oddity video and did the did the guitar chords for that, uh, he had to re relearn how to play the instrument. I almost imagine you'd have to, like, tether it to yourself, I mean, to, like, almost tie it. Yeah, it was probably, like, floating off of because you would try to. I never thought of that. See, that's yeah. great. But he, he thought he played better in uh, Space Station. <laughs> he just thought oh, really? That's his opinion. That, <laughs> no. That's... That's his own like opinion. Like, better in the shower, you know. Yeah, right, like, you should be in a different environment, and then, hey, it's all good. Right, right, right. Oh. Well, I wanted to mention, too, um, I don't know if you've ever seen the video called A Private Universe. I don't, that does not ring a bell. Okay, this is a classic. Um, you can, oh, well, you can Google it, of course, um, and unfortunately, the URL is a bit long, but I could put it on the event page afterwards. But this is... Um, it's a video that was produced by the Harvard-Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. It's back mm. in 1987, so it's kind of a classic video now. But what they did, um, they went to a Harvard graduation ceremony. So you can imagine that, uh, you know, Harvard, wonderful institution of learning, and so all you get the idea of all these really smart people. They're graduating from Harvard. These must be, you know, the, the cream of the crop kind of thing. And they asked the graduates at the ceremony... Oh. A I couple think I've of heard of this about astronomy, and one of the questions was, um, why do we have the seasons? Why, for example, is it hotter, you know, in the summer, at least in the northern hemisphere, than it is, you know, in the winter? And so, why are the seasons there? And everybody they talked to had this idea of, well, you know, it's warmer in the summer because the Earth and its orbit is a little closer to the sun than it is in the winter. And so, you know, there was this big misconception going on. And um, that was one of the first, at least for me, one of the first times, you know, I really started to think about that. You know, here are these intelligent people, and yet there's still these misconceptions. And um, so I guess I just, that's a great video to watch, just because it is, you know, it's kind of considered a classic now. Um, but it also lets you know that, you know, intelligent adult people have misconceptions and we you know it's really fun to think about and make lists of misconceptions but um, you know you have to remember that most of the time it's ideas that people have gotten you know that really make sense to them and really um, come from their own experience and you can even teach somebody so you have to the really answer right yeah and they'll <laughs> revert back to I mean we all will revert back to our misconception if you don't really break it down and for the seasons one, the one that I think is the kicker for that is if you say, okay, um, most people are aware of the fact that when it's winter in the northern hemisphere, it's summer in the southern hemisphere and vice versa. So if you ask them the question about the seasons and they tell you, well, it's when it's closer or further, then say, okay, well, you know, do you know that blah, 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 about the different hemispheres? How does that fit into that model? And that moment, <laughs> it breaks, right? <laughs> And so that's what you need to do. You really need to break, I mean, this this comes out of years of educational research. You need to break that misconception in a way that you realize, oh, that can't be the case because I, I know this other fact and they're inconsistent and now I have to build, it, it just shattered and I have to build a new model. Um, and I think that's, that's the one, because people are aware of it. The seasons are different in the different hemispheres. And until you actually make them connect that with, their misunderstanding about the sun, be, uh, the Earth being closer, and that's why it's mm -hmm. summer. You know that doesn't unless half the Earth is yet yeah, done. It doesn't work that way. So, <laughs> in fact, I mean it's we're closest to the sun in January, so it's winter in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> that just but you know most people that's don't know that. Right, and I remember for me, you know that that fact just made it amazing for me. You know? Right. So yeah. yeah. So obviously, hmm, what else is going on here? Right. So yeah. yeah. So that's, that's that's the breaking moment is when you remind them that the different hemispheres have different seasons. That yeah. that that's what helps people break that down. Yeah. 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 So yeah. So let's see. Another good misconception. Well, actually, there's some here that were truths, not not falses. 
that I didn't know much about. So one of them, one of these cards, and I know we're totally giving this away. It's like spoiler alert. Um, but one of them is gravity guides the growth of plants. And this is actually a true statement. Uh, not a misconception, and I actually had to dig a little deeper into why that is, and, and apparently they recently discovered that. Uh, there are these special cells in the tips of roots of plants. So, I mean, they, they tested this in all kinds of ways. I mean, for centuries, you know, the, you put a plant in the soil, and it's dark. How does it know roots go down and shoot goes up? Yes. And they tested this with different ways, and so they did, did you know, you, you do the cup upside down, and the plant will still grow out the correct way. Um, I don't remember what scientists did this, but they actually put a bunch of seedlings on a rotating table, and all the seedlings grew out following the following the centrifugal forces as if it was gravity. So clearly, plants figured can sense gravity, and it wasn't. I think it wasn't until more recently they discovered that there are special cells in the tips of the roots that have these little pebble-like structures in them, and so the little pebble-like structures are at the bottom of the cell, where in the direction of where gravity points down. And so that tells the plants that way it's down, that's where the roots go, up is where the shoot goes. This just I just learned this today, so this is Your fast. Own gravity sensor. It has yes, plants have gravity sensors in their roots and there's a name. Statoliths. So the little like tiny structures. I'm probably screwing this up. I'm sorry, botanist, please correct me. Um, but I just learned this today, and that's how plants actually are thought to sense gravity. And yeah, I totally want to try that rotating table experiment and watch the seedlings grow outwards. Yeah, I know. We were just talking today about um, needing a turntable and how it's too bad that there aren't enough turntables around anymore. <laughs> so there's another great application for turntables. If you've got one in your basement, get it out. Yes. Or in your yes. attic. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh, so we have a question from Janelle Duncan. Does gravity change when you are at different elevations? That is a very good question. Mm -hmm. uh, and so just as if you're in low Earth orbit, you're some distance above... Uh, so actually, it's measured from the center. Your distance from the center of the Earth uh, determines uh, the, the gravitational force that you feel. Uh, indeed, at higher and higher elevations, you are some larger distance from the surface. So uh, the acceleration due to gravity is slightly less if you're at a really high elevation. Now, of course, it's 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 tiny, 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 and really hard to measure. Um, but it is actually an effect uh, in that if you're at 16,000 feet, the acceleration due to gravity is going to be slightly smaller. Now, 16,000 feet sounds like a lot, but that's like you know the skin of the Earth, whereas the <laughs> bulk of the Earth is so much bigger. So yes, it does It does actually lessen, but by a, such a tiny amount, we don't even... And that's the problem with relying on our everyday experiences, right? Is that uh, they don't measure things accurately. <laughs> right. We're, right. We're limited, so thank you, Janelle, for that. <laughs> that's a great question. Yeah. Great question. Yeah. So one of my favorite um, questions about gravity that I ever got, and I think it's on our list somewhere, um, is the idea of if you could bore a hole mm. through, well, either at least down to the center of the Earth. And um, that, well, yeah, through, through all the All the way through, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And then if you dropped, or what would happen if you dropped something down that hole? Mm-hmm. Do we want to give the <laughs> answer? Or do we want, do we want to just let I don't know. I don't, our audience... It still kind of boggles my mind. And I don't know. I don't think we should say the answer. But okay. I, you know. I like that. I uh, this is this, this. I mean, if you've taken an intro physics class, this has probably come up. You've probably had to calculate this. I know. Yeah, uh, I, I will point out that this did. This was another. Class. This was another thought experiment. Actually, so again, researching this stuff today, this is a thought experiment that has been done throughout the ages, uh, <laughs> and I think Galileo was the first first person to really get it, and then Isaac Newton was the first person to mathematically show that the answer was the answer, and that is true. Of course, you have to neglect air resistance and running into stuff um, mm -hmm. when you think about this. But yeah, assume you drive. Okay, also, one other complication. It's easy. You can neglect whatever you want. Whatever. Yes. Assume a spherical cow. Uh, so yeah, so this pebble, and 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 also, if you assume it's uh, assume either it's not rotating or it goes down this axis of rotation, because rotation will change it, and that's also Newton calculated, uh, which is pretty cool. And so yeah, it's it's an interesting thought experiment. Of course, never done as a real experiment because we still haven't even we haven't even gotten to the mantle. I think. Oh. Of the Earth, there was a project I called. Hadn't the, gotten very far, you know, but yeah. yeah. There was a project called the mole hole experiment. <laughs> I oh. kid you not. 
And our most important mantle was in a, it was a project to reach the mantle of the Earth, and like they still have not done it. So mole hole. <laughs> I, I remember this from my Geology 101 class. Thank you, Dr. Erickson. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so we, we, we have cannots drill through the center of the Earth uh, technologically, but this thought experiment can be done, and it can be proved mathematically what will happen to that pebble. So we will leave that as an exercise for the <laughs> <laughs> I hate I hate that. It boggles the mind. I know. But it's a great one. It's a great one. So. It is a good one. Yeah, so I'm glad we included that one. And I started to get into way too much detail in my description and had to get rid of it. <laughs> Because I know <laughs> I can submit that and and Easy to do. Kathy and Alan are gonna be like, no, Easy to do. DMI. Yeah, DMI. Okay. Mm. Ooh, another one I like. Uh, all, uh, this is another true or false statement. Although you cannot feel it, there is gravitational attraction between you and the person sitting next to you. Is that true or false? Tell me, George. Is that true or false? Mm. Am I gravitationally attracted to this ninja? I'm sorry to say. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, and he loves you too. <laughs> okay, this is another, he's got a knife, I should be careful. This is another place where our common everyday experiences uh, don't quite measure up to reality. You can, act, I mean, we both have mass, and there is a finite distance between us. So yep. there is actually a very tiny gravitational force between me and the ninja. Now, of course, mm -hmm. if me and the ninja were floating about in space, not near any other object with mass, then we would be gravitationally pulled together. Uh, but because we are both gravitationally pulled to the Earth, that is by far the dominant thing. But there is there is a gravitational attraction um, between people sitting next to each other in class, and we thought that'd be a cute, a cool, cool fact to throw in. Let's take the opposite. So one of our things talks about the um, Andromeda galaxy, mm -hmm. you know, something much further away from us than the little ninja. Right. Um, are we attracted to the Andromeda galaxy, and is it attracted to us? Are we? <laughs> Actually, it's the wrong direction. It's like down here. Somewhere. Where is it? <laughs> it has um, not risen high enough to be visible during my. Um, sorry, during my um, blah, 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 my public observing nights. So. Not there yet. <laughs> anyway, go on. Sorry. Yeah, no. So that's, you know, something sort of the other, I don't know, extreme or the other side of the coin kind of thing. So mm -hmm. so smallish things that are close, you know, yes, there's still that force of gravity acting. Um, but what about a really huge thing that's yeah. very far away? Does yep. that mean is it so far away that, ah, uh, you know, there's, there's no effect anymore because it just... You know, it's something, it's another common thing that people think is, you know, you get far enough away, whatever effect you're talking about, whether it be magnetism or, you know, electricity, you know, it kind of dies out because you're just far enough away at some point. And no. Only if the distance is infinity. If it is f actually mathematically infinity, and we do live in a finite universe, uh, you you do get the gravitational attraction of everything in the universe. It is not zero. It is to the point where it is realistically negligible. Now, of course, this is not. This is ignoring the fact that at some point, <laughs> right? I, I I actually had to put ignoring dark energy because at some <laughs> point, at some point. Um, the acceleration of the universe will be the 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 actual acceleration, the chain of the frame, the frame of the universe will be greater than the speed of light, which is the speed of gravity. Oh, there's a lot to unpack there, but uh, at, at some point uh, that will no longer be the case. Um, but within the observable universe, of course, um, we have not reached that yet, and so yes, we are gravitationally attracted to everything <laughs> in the universe. <laughs> There's a lot of caveats there. I'm sorry. There are, I know. <laughs> that's where it gets Ignore, that's why I just said ignoring dark energy. Right. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's fascinating, but it's also very frustrating because yeah. part of you just says, you know, I just want to understand this gravity thing. Yes. Yes. And then, to be you know, simple. typical with life, you know, it's way more complicated than we would like it to be, but... You know, but that's okay. It is, yeah. That's so okay. that's the challenge of getting your your mind around it. So. So we have a comment from Peachy Holyfield, who's the author of the book that is my mouse pad. <laughs> Yay! Uh, he said he just saw the. Uh, ooh, I'm jealous. The movie Gravity, which is a sci-fi one of this this new trend of sci-fi stories that is 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 uh, not too far in the future, and so it's just barely on the edge of what's possible today. Um, he apparently got to see it at a pre-screening event and can't wait to talk about it. So this is kind of a horror thriller set in space. Okay. 
Um, I know the trailer was like amazing. Uh, it's what what goes wrong in you know in space in the absence of your normal gravitational environment. Uh, so yeah, I'm jealous that he got to see it already. So if anyone else has seen Gravity, kudos, and I'll try and find a screening um, here. Yeah. <laughs> Something to look forward to. Excellent. Yeah. But I cannot talk on that movie because I haven't seen it yet. So. <laughs> Yes, this is not about the movie Gravity. I'm sorry if you tuned in and thought we'd be talking about the movie. <laughs> We're talking about the actual Maybe later. Universe. Maybe later. All right. <laughs> Some other time. Yeah. All right. Good. All right. So we want to pick out another one? Sure. Let me find it. Oh, uh, let's see. Mm. Oh, this is a good one. You got one? Because it was it's an interesting one. The, the the statement was planets with thin atmospheres have little gravity. Is that true or false? Oh, okay. That's a tough one to unpack. True or false. Yeah. So planets with thin atmospheres have little gravity. Uh so the statement as it's written is saying, well, if it has less atmosphere, then somehow the gravitational force is smaller, and that's not necessarily true. So I would go ahead and put this statement as false. Um, the atmosphere itself does not affect the gravitational pull of the planet. Uh, your gravitational pull depends on the mass of the planet beneath you, not the mass of the of the air above you. That affects the air pressure that you feel, but it doesn't affect gravity. Now, the, the connection here is that often what can happen for smaller planets is that Smaller planets have uh, lower gravitation on their surface, and so they're more likely to lose their atmosphere. However, that's not a strict one-to-one -one correlation. For example, Venus and Earth are about the same mass and radius, but Venus has way higher surface air pressure. Uh, it has a much thicker atmosphere than the Earth does. Um, but they're the same mass and pretty much the same mass and radius. There are other factors like distance to the star, there's the temperature, of the planet based on the distance to the star, uh, whether or not there's a strong magnetic field has to has a lot to do with it, mm -hmm. and so that statement as written is false, but you can see why someone would make that um, yeah. connection. Yeah, and even, you know, kids, we always talk about the moon, and does it have an atmosphere, and well, we used to just simply say, well, no, it doesn't, and now, you know, we can maybe talk a little bit more about that, too, you know, so maybe there's some traces of stuff up there, but either way, you know, we always say, eh, it's too small to have really, you know, substantial atmosphere. So, you know, you make that connection between, oh, small thing, you know, hardly any atmosphere. So right. um, you sort of overgeneralize in a way or just make Put a connection the box. that isn't based on having all, you know, of the information. Like mm -hmm. you say, so much more going on. And um, and then it's very, you know, easy to take that sort of relationship that you think is is true and, and then transfer it to other contexts and overgeneralize and before you know it you know you have a really um, deep set misconception <laughs> about the relationship between um, gravity and atmosphere so you know these things um, I think almost what's as fascinating as thinking about them is thinking about how they formed in the first place these misconceptions mm -hmm. so to me it's very interesting to you know try to figure out what how people think how that misconception could have gotten there in the first place um, to see all the different things, because that's actually very fascinating, too. Yeah. So. so we have a question from uh, on YouTube from Jeff Air 101 Is gravity affecting the Voyager probe? And if so, why doesn't it fall back? So we recently had news that, yet again, Voyager left the solar system. <laughs> Depending on your definition of solar system, we debated this on the weekly space hangout. <laughs> but uh, the, the Voyager space probe um, is is moving further and further away from the sun. So the sun makes up most of the mass of the solar system, um, and so that's the the gravitational field that it is most uh, affected by. However, its orbit is such that uh, it's moving at a velocity that is great enough that it can escape that gravitational pull. And this actually is, helps define what the escape velocity of something is. How do you get a rocket? off of Earth and to the Moon. It's got to escape the gravitational well of Earth to some extent, at least as far as the Moon. Um, and so you can actually calculate that using the mass and radius of the object you're trying to escape. So taking its gravitational field into account, you have to move at a velocity that is fast enough that the pull of gravity is too weak to be able to pull it back. Now, gravity is the weakest of the fundamental forces, so it turns out it's not that hard to <laughs> build a rocket. <clears throat> off you go. Okay, that's oversimplifying, but it is the weakest of the of the fun. 
being <laughs> flipping. Really giving people misconceptions. I'm being oh, flippant about everything. No, it's really expensive, right. really, really, really hard to do. But um, <laughs> gravity is the weakest fundamental force. And so, yeah, um, you can get an object moving fast enough and... Uh, this is the same thing for things that are orbiting. There's a certain speed you have to reach in order to be able to orbit the Earth and not fall down and crash onto the surface. You need to be going fast enough that you miss the surface and keep going, basically. <laughs> so that's how I think of it. Um, and if you're doing escape velocity, you have to be fast enough that you are escaping the gravitational potential of Earth, so, or, or in this case, the Sun. So that's why Voyager's speed, the speed that it was given as it was sent off into the outer solar system, is that incredible speed is what allows it to um, to not fall back as not a function of gravity. Yep. So yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and I don't remember what the speed is, and I totally looked it up during the weekly space hangout we talked about it, and it's completely oh, I, gone I, from my brain. So, right. it was there and it's gone. <laughs> but it is fast enough that that yes, it escapes the gravitational pull. I mean, yes, it's still feeling the gravity, um, but it's still moving fast enough that it's not it's not bringing it back. It's just going. It's just, okay. it's gone. It's done. <laughs> it's just, just going to keep going. So, thank you for that question. Well, let's do, there's, this is one I actually don't know a lot about. Mm. So, we had plants with gravity sensors, sort of, before. So, apparently, bacteria can also get in on the gravity sensing action. Um, we have one of our statements, without gravity, some bacteria get tougher. Yes. And... I have no idea. <laughs> I had to look that one up, and I was because that was a totally new one for me. And I, I you know, I, I put that exact statement in Google and found where they got it from. There was a study done in 2007 of Salmonella bacteria, and I'm not sure if it was on the International Space Station or on one of the shuttle missions, but it was, you know, in a low microgravity environment. Um, they tested uh, how virulent or how uh, harmful Salmonella bacteria are. It turns out they are three times more virulent in a microgravity environment. And they tested this on some poor mice, uh, which <laughs> ate food tainted with Salmonella. So um, with less Salmonella... Uh, oh God, I can't think of the word. With, with less Salmonella bacteria present in the food and the infection happened faster. And so it turns out Salmonella is Much more, is potent, in more space. potent in space. Uh, and it's they're not sure why, but they did notice that the proteins and the genes in Salmonella acted a little bit differently in that environment. They're just not sure exactly why it all happened that way. Cool. But yeah, so not only... There's potential there, actually. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right there. Somebody write that story. <laughs> Yeah, I know, I'm thinking Andromeda strain, but that's exactly what they referenced. <laughs> that's a classic. Did they? Okay. Ooh, in, in the article about it, yeah, or in the article about the paper that I found. That's what they. So there's something about space that makes things tougher. <laughs> Except yeah. humans. Yeah. Except <laughs> humans, because as we put as one of our well, states. There's another. Yeah. Yeah. What did I? Uh, being on the space station, so in a microgravity environment, can cause yeah. problems such as bone and muscle loss, and this is again a problem for astronauts who are. In low Earth orbit for quite a while, um, your body decides, oh, I don't need all this muscle, I don't need to stand, <laughs> and actually breaks it down and starts using it for other things. Yeah. Um, and, and same for bone as well, and so astronauts have to keep up a very vigorous exercise program in a microgravity environment in order to not fall down as soon as they come back. To but I think people get taller, right? Do you they start to? I don't know. Oh, yeah, no, I think I've heard that one because I'm a short person. I pulled that out of like 20 years ago or something. I have no idea if that's really true, but I used to hear that a lot. Maybe uh, you get a bit taller. Yeah, I think I've heard, I think people have specifically said that to me because I'm 5'1. No. Uh, How much taller do I ever get to say? No. I'm like 5'1 and a half it's in space. Taller. Uh, and other things, they're, they're always um, sound like they have a cold because all the fluid in the nasal oh, passages. Oh. Um, and so astronauts yeah, are yeah. constantly stuffy, and they can't <laughs> smell anything in space. Yeah, there's all these weird little effects that happen uh, because we're, our bodies evolved in a 1G environment. That's how they work well. Yeah, and we like to be. Yeah, and that that is a significant. Long term. Yeah, that is a significant issue for long-term space exploration. And yeah. So you know, do we send our ship spinning so that it simulates gravity, or do yeah. we, you know? What do we do? What do we do? Yeah, mm -hmm. I've heard some really crazy, crazy stories of of, of astronauts who just, um, especially during some of the um, the Mir space, I mean, 
spent a year, year and a half on Mir. Long time. Um, you know, they they were wheelchair bound when they came back home, and and it took them a few days to get their strength back and people <laughs> walk. I that, that's like really serious. Yep. So. Yeah. Oh. No, oh, I don't know. Um, I'd still go. Hey. Well, I know. Yeah. Uh, oh, and does the speed decline? So, uh, about the Voyager probe question, does the speed decline? Um, I think it's far enough out at this point that it's uh, the gravity is so low that it's not causing it to slow down. So it's pretty much just going to coast now at this point. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, they would have to, if it was st staying close to the sun, they would have to keep speeding it up in order to keep it from crashing down. That's so. a great question. A good yes. question. Yes. Yeah. Yes, good um. questions. Yes, yes, Veer. Right. <laughs> Watching a lot of Babylon Five. <laughs> yes. Together, okay. Yes, yes Veer. <laughs> um, any last comments I don't know. on Looking graphics? Through our list, um, I don't know. I think we've hit some of the big ones. A lot of the big ones, and I don't want to give them all away either. Yes, let's not do that. But when we th when will um is so investigate is still in the process of being worked on. We're doing. If by some chance you happen to be in the area near Edwardsville, Illinois, we are doing a, fo a teacher focus group on Columbus Day, October fourteenth. Mm -hmm. uh, so please, please email us if you are local and want to do that on your day off. Play with us. Play science with us. Uh, uh, yeah. We'll be testing out some of these activities with the teacher focus group. And uh, at that point, I think we'll be submitting it for educational review with NASA. Yeah, with NASA. It goes through NASA review. And, um, and actually, even if you're not local, if you would like to try out um, parts of this unit, you know, we just need people that can, can pilot something in their classroom, sure. too. And so we can email this baby right out to you. Um, try out a little bit in your classroom with your students. It's targeted for middle school. It, you know, a lot of it could be um, upper elementary, um, depending on how comfortable you know you are as a teacher with it. With the material, it can certainly be used um, in high school as well, because as you've noticed, you know, these concepts can really be unpacked, and and there's adults that still are, you know, grapple with the idea of you know what gravity is all about. So certainly, you know, you can do a lot of good stuff with high school students mm -hmm. with this. So if you are um, anywhere and you would like to try out parts of our new unit and um, we would love to have you do that and give us your feedback um, all over email electronically that's wonderful yep. so it's up um, on the so it's up on her screen would like to do that and we'd be we'd be really grateful for that um, and then yes sometimes uh, or sometime next early next year it should be um, finished and out and available so at cosmoquest.org yeah, this yeah, so the emails on her screens, educate at cosmoquest.org, because my Google toolbox is broken. <laughs> educate at cosmoquest.org. Um we also have a newsletter which we should be sending out because it's the end of the month already. Yes. We should do that at some yeah. point this week. Um if you go to Educator Zone, um if you go to CosmoQuest up on the top bar, it says educate in the menu, come down, educator zone. It's cosmoquest.org slash blog slash educator zone, but just look for that. Um, that is where we post all of our teacher materials, uh, links to our educational partners who also have awesome materials like the Galileo Teacher Training Program and Dark Skies Bright Kids. Um, yeah. And there's also a newsletter. So we have a monthly newsletter for, specifically for educators that uh, comes out the end of every month. Uh, and you, there's a sign up form on that web page there and so you will get stuff from us every month as we, we put stuff out and so it'll be links to learning space, it'll be links to the new stuff um, that we're piloting and yeah like I said early next year and um, definitely in time for the NSTA meeting in when is that? March? It's either March, March. or early April. April, right because it was Yuri's night last April. time, it was April. <laughs> anyway, the, we, yes, with the, the name Investigate came out of a <laughs> conversation <laughs> So uh, our, our two curriculum, other curriculum developers uh, and I were at NSTA in San Antonio, and because the abstract deadline for the meeting is exactly a year in advance, <laughs> we're sitting in the hotel after NSTA, trying to come up, we knew we were going to do a unit about asteroids, and we're trying to come up with a title for this abstract and investigate. I think that was Kathy's husband who came up with that one. I don't know, because he is text good. Message. He's very good at naming things. And so that's where we're like, all right, we're calling yeah, it that. That's perfect. That's perfect. So if you, if you happen to be at, a, at the oh, National yeah. NSTA meeting, we'll be demoing stuff there, too. So yeah. Yeah. it's pretty cool. A lot cool. of good stuff coming up. 
Um, and send us your gravity misconceptions. Yes, that would be cool. We can add them to this card set uh, and, and grow that a bit and make more work for me because I have to write the, the explanations why things are true or false without getting too long-winded. <laughs> <laughs> Keep it simple. Oh, oh. yeah. Uh, you can do it. My brain is everywhere today. Uh, all right. Thank you guys so much for joining us on Learning Space. Let me check okay. the comment sources again. Uh, I think we're good for now, so all the comment sources. Uh, thank you guys for joining us on Learning Space. Um, the next Hangout is Friday, noon Pacific, 3 Eastern, the weekly space Hangout. Uh, I missed last week's. I'm sure it was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, the uh, Our group of, of astronomy journalists and wannabe journalists like me, uh, <laughs> pretend journalists, uh, talk about the top stories in space and astronomy from the week, hosted by Fraser Kane. And on Sunday night, I think they're starting at 8.30 Pacific. They might be pulling it back earlier soon. I'll have to check. Uh, Fraser Kane and Scott Lewis do the virtual star party. And so you totally want to check this out, especially if you can't get out to a uh, star party near you locally. You can sit at your computer and look at pretty pictures of the sky from yeah. our amateur astronomers all over the country and all over the world. you got bad um, weather. It's always Good yeah. viewing on the internet. With it's it. always good. It's clear. So actually, there's been a couple of nights where it was cloudy for everybody who was available. And oh was no! But that's because there's a lot of guys on the west coast. Yeah. yeah, and it depends on who's available, who's got you know, yeah, kids, jobs, all those things. So yeah, there's it's it's rarely, but it has been canceled a couple times. <laughs> but usually it's on. Uh, and then Monday, I think Fraser and Hamler are back to doing astronomy cast. Uh, Oh. Sam was back in the country, so I think that's happening again. <laughs> okay. So that's uh, our, our usual weekly lineup of Hangouts. All right, so thank you, Georgia. All right, thanks, Nicole. Welcome back. Yay. And we'll see everybody next week. See you guys next week. Bye-bye. Oh, what are we doing next week? I want to promo next week. What are we doing next week? I don't remember. I don't know. Do you... Wait, wait. Wait, I haven't sent out the um, newsletter yet, which is why I haven't been thinking of it. Oh, we're talking about the blog from the Hubble Candles Project. So we're talking to a couple of astronomers who translate their, their findings for the general public on a blog, which is awesome. Uh, so we met them at the ASP uh, a couple months ago. So, yeah, it'll all be right, good. Excellent. We'll carry some dot astronomy love with, with that, too. So, all yeah. right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Good. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.